Hey everyone, my name is Zeke Ziesman, and it has been a while since I've done a YouTube video. In fact, I think the last time I reviewed a movie on YouTube at all was Multiverse of Madness. Yeah, I looked like this. In fact, I was gonna record this review for TikTok, but as I was writing it, I figured I had so much to say, and the retention rate of a TikTok video is like five seconds. So, a YouTube video is in order. So without further ado, let's talk about Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. If you follow me on Letterboxd or Twitter, you'll know that I had one word to describe every single aspect of this movie, underdeveloped. There are multiple times throughout this movie where it asks you to care about a certain character or an event, but you just don't because the movie barely spends any time making you care. This is unfortunately true for a lot of the new characters that are introduced, some of which I thought were actually really cool when they first showed up, only for them to barely get any screen time until the third act. So when that time comes and the movie's like, hey, remember this character from the beginning? They're in danger, isn't that bad? You just don't care. In fact, I think my biggest question after watching this movie is why did Bill Murray's character get a whole character poster? I mean, the guy's barely in it. Since we're on the topic of characters, I should probably talk about our main cast of characters, starting with Hope and Hank, who are just kind of there. I mean, they don't really contribute a whole lot. Except for one specific scene with Hank that just kind of comes out of nowhere. It's towards the second act. If you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's just really disappointing after spending two movies building up these characters, getting you to like them, only for them to barely have anything to do in the finale. Ant-Man himself, I mean, it's Paul Rudd, he does a pretty good job at making you laugh. Especially this scene, which is definitely the funniest part of the movie, and I think is the only time it got an actual audible laugh out of me. The rest of the movie's jokes were just kinda... <laughs> he probably gets the most to actually do in this movie, which I mean, you'd expect. But what really irks me about him in this movie is that they set up this really cool character arc of him being self-indulgent and arrogant ever since saving the world in Endgame, but then they just didn't do anything with it. It's like they just forgot about that. And it's really annoying because there's no resolve to it. They set it up and then there's zero payoff. I think a lot of people are going to walk out of this movie disliking Cassie in a Star-Lord and Infinity War type of way. She's extremely impulsive throughout the movie, which leads to a lot of what happens in the movie. And it could have led to a cool character arc if they, you know, decided to give her one. She also has a short little conversation with Modoc during the third act, who's another character where there's not a whole lot to say because there's not a whole lot of him, which might be one of the worst conversations I've heard in a movie in recent memory. Yeah, dialogue is not this movie's strong suit. But enough of me ripping on the characters in this movie, because this isn't all bad. Michelle Pfeiffer as Janet Van Dyne is great. She steals basically every scene that she's in, as long as she's not on screen with the actual scene stealer of this movie, Jonathan Majors as Kang the Conqueror. Oh my god, is he the silver lining of this movie. I don't think I've been this excited for a villain's return in a while, but I need more Kang in my life. Jonathan Majors is amazing in this role, and I cannot wait to see him again in Loki Season 2. Now, as far as the VFX and cinematography go, uh, if you've seen the trailers, you kind of know what to expect. It's very hit or miss, especially with MODOK. Now, I know I made that video a while back making fun of people who were mad that he looked comic accurate in the movie, but trust me, once you see this guy's face in motion, you will wish he kept that mask on. But I also can't knock down that a lot of the VFX are actually really good. Especially for having to do a full CG environment for a large majority of the film. And for the cinematography, like I said, very hit or miss. One shot will be one that I would want to hang up on my wall, and then the next will make you question if they even had a storyboard to prepare for that shot. Sometimes it feels like they just didn't have anything prepared and they just had to do everything on the spot, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's actually what happened. As far as the actual plot of the movie goes, I really have no complaints. I think it could have been paced a little better, but I think that's more of an editing thing. But I mean, there's nothing in the actual story that didn't make sense to me, so thumbs up for that. The two post credit scenes are actually pretty good. I think the second one got me a lot more hype than the first one did, which might be the opposite effect they were going for, but hey, I can't control what I'm excited for. Overall, everything in this movie circles back to that one word, underdeveloped. Phase 5 is off to probably the weakest start out of any of the phases, but hey, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 actually looks really good, so let's hope that can redeem it. I'm going to give Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania a 4 out of 10. 
Well, I'm sorry to come back to YouTube on a bad note, and I can't really promise that uploads will be any more frequent on here. But who knows, maybe this will happen with every movie I see this year, and I'll just have to move movie reviews over to YouTube. Because of that, make sure you follow the socials, because if I'm not on here, I'm probably on one of those. And this has been Zeke Ziesman, signing off.